Okay, so it's actually very difficult to speak at the end when everybody else has said during the whole rest of the day everything you want to cover. Uh, nevertheless, I am going to run through um, three things. The themes of our engagement at the European Public Health Alliance with the, uh, AMR, uh, what civil society organisations can do and contribute, and then what briefly we've done so far and what we envisage to do in the future. And I'm going to start with three strands of action, obviously one health. Um, as has just been highlighted, we represent the people, the public in public health. Um, and so very much we want to make sure that in the, the healthcare aspect of One Health, we're talking about uh, from our members' perspective, who are patients' organisations, professional groups, representatives of marginalised communities or people who work with them, uh, all across the public health uh, uh, sphere, the public part of uh, healthcare. We're also active in um, uh, animal and uh, 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 health, especially when it comes to dietary shift. Uh, as, as part of uh, better husband dreams, what we see uh, uh, a benefit for uh, animal health to human health, uh, especially better and less animal products because of the improvements to uh, 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 AMR lower uh, requirements for microbials. But it's also important to stress that animal health and better husbandry and associated dietary shifts have a much bigger footprint on human health, uh, especially when it comes to the benefits to non-communicable diseases that dietary shifts promotes. And then environmental health. I can see why people struggle, really. Um, and environmental health, I wanted to highlight something about um, evidence-based policy making. Uh, we heard earlier on that uh, the Danes, the Norwegians, and the Swedes all had different dosage over different periods for the same antibiotic, for, for the same treatment of the same uh, uh, condition. And they were presumably all using the same evidence base, and they all think that they're correct. Um, so evidence-based policy making can lead to very different outcomes. Um, and that's when you have uh, an honest use of the same evidence base. Uh, and very often, that's not the case. And that's especially true in uh, climate change. And so in a month's time, the European Commission will adopt uh, a whole raft of measures on uh, climate resilience and water resilience. And that should be uh, a, a very key part of the environmental element, the environmental health element of AMR control. Um, but of course, you have one part of the, the evidence base people saying that means more engineering, more water treatment, more control of floods through engineering solutions. Other side saying that means more biodiversity, more slow the flow, more nature to help flood risk management. Uh, they're using the same evidence base, coming to polar opposite conclusions about what is necessary. So I think it's really important that we have a one health that means health is at the forefront, that health is the fundamental driver for the policy. So that's one theme for our strand of action on, on, on AMR, one health. We also have health in all of our all policies. <coughs> this is a, um, a slide from a film uh, a projection that we did onto the European Commission headquarters. That building is the Bellamont, the, the headquarters of the European Commission. We did uh, a, a whole little film about the broken promise. We can't eat broken promises. The Commission had promised under the Farm to Fork program uh, uh, the aspect of the European Green Deal to actually change and have a shift on, on diets, uh, especially with a food environments framework proposal. That's been dropped. So is front of pack labelling, so is of many other elements of that, that component of the Green Deal. Um, so that strand of work that we do is mainly focused upon non-communicable diseases. But there is certainly an element of that work which translates to the animal health and the animal husbandry component of the, the fight against antimicrobial resistance. So we, that is just one aspect of the work that we do that we're active in. Other elements would be global health, climate change, all relating and us uh, 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 advocating for 
those policies, but with a health perspective, including antimicrobial resistance uh, and, and the fight against it. So that's health in all policies. It was mentioned briefly this morning, uh, another thread is health equity. And I, I would really strongly suggest that this is a, a, a really important key component if we're going to combat antimicrobial resistance. It's easy to neglect because it's easy to think that 70% of uh, uh, the problem is in healthcare settings. Therefore, the overwhelming majority of the problem is in uh, 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 those groups who have access and those groups who are able to, to uh, penetrate the, the healthcare system. However, it's also the case that we've ignored or buried the issue of health equity. It's notable when I was looking for pictures to illustrate this point, all of the pictures that Google Images throw up at me were from right-wing media outlets saying, these are nasty threats, these are the baddies coming to infect you with the superbugs. Um, uh, we haven't framed this yet about rights, about human rights, the right to health, and about fighting discrimination to secure those rights as a way to address issues around AMR, especially when you consider conditions like MDR and XDR-TB, where an overwhelming majority of those people who present with those conditions are from very marginalised, excluded or discriminated against communities, whether they be migrants, undocumented migrants, asylum seekers, prisoners, injecting drug users, homeless, et cetera, et cetera. So we really need to include that aspect of our work, uh, in, our, in our work, health equity. So those are the three strands for our action. What role can we play? Um, I think one of the biggest things we can contribute to is the raising awareness. And that's not just in formal education settings that was just uh, uh, alluded to in the, the work package, but also in, in collaboration with, with our members in healthcare professionals, in patient organisations, so that people like myself, boomers, actually get reached, not just school-aged children or university students, um, about the prudent use of antimicrobials and what you should be asking your doctor when you present as a patient uh, and what you should expect as well as a, 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 an ordinary citizen. There's also the role of building a compelling and easy to understand narrative uh, for citizens on AMR. And I'm absolutely delighted uh, with the reference to not calling it antimicrobial resistance because um, you then have to spend five minutes when you're talking to your aunt at Christmas of what you do for a living, what the hell antimicrobial resistance is. So um, uh, uh, explaining in language that everybody immediately understands and, uh, and actually embraces is really important. There's also advocating for AMR as a priority at the national, at the EU, and on the global agenda. And that's something that civil society can use our voice to actually uh, 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 achieve. And then there's the promotion of transparent evidence-based policymaking through translating the research into policy recommendations and how those recommendations relate to communities and their engagement with both the policy process and with healthcare and healthcare professionals. And then finally, there's the building communities of uh, AMR action, uh, so at the EU and global level, and they're linked to things like the EU's global health strategy and other health threats, especially climate change. So that's the role we can play. So what have we done? Well, we've actually uh, 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 stimulated and acted as the secretariat for a stakeholder group on antimicrobial resistance, and we will continue to do that. We've also established uh, an intergroup, uh, uh, sorry, let's get that terminology specific and correct, an interest group of the European Parliament. Um, uh, and that's a cross political party group of uh, members of the European Parliament who are actively convinced on the need for action on AMR. Now, some of them sit in the, the Environment Committee, which deals with health. Others sit in the Trade Committee, others sit in the uh, uh, Industry Committee. So having those people who have a, a different role in different aspects of policymaking is really, really key across the European Parliament. 
and we will see how that pans out in the next uh, parliamentary mandate period after the elections. Uh, we know that that parliament will be of a different makeup to the current parliament and that it will be much more polarised because of the, the, that's what the opinion polls are currently telling us. We need to work with the new parliament to ensure that a similar uh, 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 impact across the political spectrum is achievable in the next mandate period of the parliament. And then we have a role in uh, what we've done in raising the issue in significant international fora. So we have signed, our, our Director General Milka Sokolovic has signed a memorandum of understanding with Hans Kluger of the European region of the WHO uh, for a partnership on our work. And that was most uh, uh, evident at the regional committee meeting in Astana where we made a strong statement in support of the roadmap. Uh, uh, that partnership will continue and our relationship with WHO Europe will continue and our role within that partnership of promoting AMR actions will continue. As will things such as the, the uh, way we uh, raised AMR at the Gastein Health Forum, the European Health Forum Gastein, we had a whole session specifically on the animal health component of One Health, which was unusual but enabled people from across the health community to better understand the animal health component because they were obviously well versed on the human health component and how that links to the animal health component is very important if we're going to see progress. So that's a brief run through of, of uh, the themes that we've, we've harnessed, uh, uh, what CSOs in general can do and what we have done.